and we build uh, deep water robotic submarines and we analyze the video data that we collect in order to learn more about our ocean wilderness. So we've been working predominantly on the West Coast for the last 17 years, uh, doing primarily exploration because the ocean is so poorly understood. And uh, we typically dive to anywhere from 150 feet down to 2,500 feet deep in search of uh, deep sea corals, fisheries, and stock assessments. And I'd like to introduce um, our partner, Dr. Jeff Shester. Well, it's great to be here, Dirk. Uh, we've, uh, Oceana has been uh, partnering with uh, Mare for a number of years now. Um, we're, we're really excited to talk about uh, our, our expedition in Southern California together. Um, Oceana is a, uh, an international nonprofit organization dedicated to protecting the world's oceans. And we're, uh, we have offices in 12 different countries throughout the world. We've had an office uh, here in California since 2005 and uh, work with uh, great scientists like Dirk and his team to try to uh, get uh, areas in the ocean uh, protected from destructive fishing practices uh, while, while maintaining vibrant fisheries as well. So on this particular expedition, you were able to lure uh, Jacques Cousteau's granddaughter out to join us. Yeah, it was, uh, it was actually um, uh, amazing to have uh, Alexandra Cousteau, who's the granddaughter of the famous explorer Jacques Cousteau, uh, out there on the boat with us. Um, it was great for her to bring it, her expertise. Um, she's got a huge international following, huge media attention. Uh, she serves as a senior advisor to Oceana and advises us on a number of the different projects that we do. And it was really just exciting to have her uh, be on the boat with us, uh, bring that energy and enthusiasm for exploration, and just that, I think, innate curiosity that, that, she, that she brings. Um, she's been scuba diving since she was seven years old, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and once she found out about what we were doing, she was like, hey, where do I sign up? And was, uh, was really just excited to see the team, to play with all the great uh, gadgets that the Mare engineers had, uh, to fly a, a drone that we were able to fly around, and just, just you know, use the kind of latest and greatest in technologies for the benefit of conservation. So it was really, uh, really neat to see to, to see her out there and and to have her with us. And and I think the the spirit and legacy that she brings along with her. And she's such a, a marvelous spokesperson. She gave, she nicknamed our robotic submarine. Remember when she was doing that first press release? She said, <laughs> "And here's the Beagle. This bad boy can dive to three thousand feet deep." And so that's been our nickname for our robotic submarine ever since, thanks to Alexandra. Yeah, and so, uh, so I was thinking I'd show maybe uh, just a couple of uh, photos for people from the expedition. I'll, uh, I'll try uh, sharing my screen here so you can, uh, so you can see um, how the, what, some of the stuff that we were actually looking at. Um, this, uh, this photo here I wanted to start with just because this is a, um, a, a black coral off of Hawaii and uh, this, this kind of helps tell the story of what we're looking at because this, this coral, uh, which some of my colleagues uh, took, took photos of and collected, uh, scientists were able to age it and see how old this, this, this coral is, kind of the same way that people can count tree rings on large trees. And they were actually able to radiocarbon date this, uh, this species to over 4,000 years old, making this, uh, this deep sea coral the oldest known uh, form of animal life uh, on the planet it, as far as the yet that we've discovered. So uh, what that means is that these things are extremely long lived and we've got these ancient groves of corals right in, in our backyard. And one thing that I didn't really realize until I got more into this issue is that off of the, the west coast of the United States, we don't really think of it as like tropical coral reefs, but we actually have over 101 different species of coral. And these take all different forms from these mushroom corals to uh, gorgonians and sea fans uh, to the, the bubblegum coral you see on the lower right of your screen. There's just a tremendous diversity of these right off the coast. And that was really why we wanted to partner with Mare. They had expertise in uh, studying corals up and down the coast already through uh, robotic uh, uh, remotely, under, uh, remotely operated vehicles called ROVs. Um, and, and so what we, what we set out to do is really learn more about these, these uh, amazing uh, species and habitats that they make. And what, what is really amazing is that corals 
not only are long lived, uh, beautiful and diverse, but the critical linkage with fisheries and conservation is they, they really provide the habitat and homes for, for, things, for, for things like fish that are commercially caught uh, to live and hide in. 98% uh, of all the life uh, in the ocean, uh, all the different species are either on or in the seafloor. And so these structures that corals make provide uh, homes for, for the animals, places to hide, places to get food, places to lay their eggs and places to raise their young. So you can see some of these images here on, on the right are really showing the many different functions that, that corals play in the ecosystem in fostering not just diversity themselves, but uh, production of, of fisheries that we depend on. Uh, unfortunately, the real concern that, that I think brought us together is the uh, effects of uh, bottom trawl fishing. And so bottom trawling is a, a fishing method that's used off of the West Coast and throughout the world. It basically drags uh, large nets uh, that are weighed down by, by doors called trawl doors that can weigh several tons. And basically it, it, it goes along and, and, and is pulled by the, the bottom. Uh, to, and drags along the seabed uh, in, in, in search of fish. So you might imagine uh, what happens if these, uh, these trawls go through one of these ancient groves of, cor of corals that could be you know, hundreds to thousands of years old. Uh, this is basically an irreversible type of impact. And so the, the real goal was to try to figure out how do we, how do we map and, and start to identify and get a recognition among policymakers of where these corals are so that we can uh, enact policies that protect the groves of, of corals that are right off of our coastline. So here's a, here's- Jeff, can I, can I add something? Yeah. Um, one of the other benefits of deep sea corals and sponges is in pharmaceutical products. So there are enzymes that are used that are currently uh, being applied to breast cancer, uh, anti-inflammatory drugs, and we don't even know half of what's out there. And it, and, and the tests have not been done, so we would hate to extinct a species that may have huge benefits for humanity. And when you think about the COVID crisis right now, who knows? These are such long-lived species that have learned how to heal themselves in a changing ocean. Maybe they have a secret that we don't know about yet. So that's just another reason why, why these may have a tremendous value in and above the fisheries service that they provide. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think uh, something that Alexandra said uh, when, when she was out there is that we, we don't want to be discovering these things by picking them up in a trawl net after once we discover them, they're already gone. Let's use the, the latest technologies, the, uh, the beagle, or the, the, the bad boy here that you can see in this uh, photograph to, uh, to document these, these species. Uh, because you're right, they, they have uh, immense uh, potential benefits that haven't even been tapped yet. We talk about them a lot of times, kind of like we, we've just scratched the surface at some ancient you know, ruins of an ancient civilization. And we don't really even know what it means or what we really even discovered yet and how valuable it is. So let's, let's make sure that we can protect that area and better identify it and study it uh, before it gets damaged and bring this to the public and to the policymakers that can enact those protections. So you can see uh, this is this is the team assembled here with uh, with crew from uh, the, the federal government as well as from uh, Mare and Oceana. Um, you see Alexander Cousteau right here uh, in the middle of the screen. You can see what's uh, amazing about these remote operated vehicles is just you know they've got hundreds and hundreds of feet of this uh, green spaghetti like uh, cable here that is really the the the, the way that these ROVs can go down uh, deep beneath the surface. So you can see kind of from, from, this, uh, from these two photos here, this on the left is what the ROV looks like underwater. Uh, and, and it's got all these amazing lights, uh, cameras, sensors. It basically has uh, thrusters that are basically propellers that move it around. So from the, from the, the, the boat itself, it's kind of like a video game. You can actually see exactly what the ROV is seeing, uh, move it around left and right, up and down. And, and, and it's this real, um, really amazing team that uh, is, is allowing us to go just a few miles off of the, of, of the coast of uh, Los Angeles and Santa Barbara to see some of these places that, that no one's ever actually seen before. You can see uh, on the right, uh, the, the Shearwater vessel that was uh, operated by the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary. And, and so this is where the, uh, the, the big A-frame of the, of the vessel is used to put the ROV in and out. And you can see this cable coming out there and uh, 
all these bubbles are basically made by all the thrusters uh, moving water around. So really uh, an exciting uh, technology to use uh, and, and really some, a way to get at some of these places because we, we really know more about the surface of the moon and some of the planets like Mars than we do uh, about what the seafloor looks like just a couple miles away from where millions of people live in Los Angeles on all these beaches. And, so, and Jeff, yeah. uh, I, we, we try to use predictive maps uh, to help guide us to areas of high probabilities of coral and I mentioned earlier that very little of the ocean has really been explored below scuba depth of 100 feet. So we had fairly poor success uh, initially finding corals. But I, re I remember we would, we would dive all day and then the boat would motor all night and we would dive all day. And we covered a lot of ground on that particular expedition. But we did find some incredibly healthy, what they call coral gardens. And, um, that is some of the data that you were able to bring to the highest authorities and really make a difference. Great. Well, so what we were able to accomplish in, uh, in, in, in a five-day expedition is uh, 13 different dives at, at these really special places uh, from the Channel Islands, uh, the Northern Channel Islands, Santa Barbara Island, and all the way down to Butterfly Bank near the U.S.-Mexico border. And uh, as Dirk said, we spent a lot of time working with scientists and a lot of these areas had the first ever maps taken by side scan and sonar and, and, and ships at the surface that really identified these you know, strange features that looked like they might have corals in them. Uh, and so this was what was able to help us find uh, some of these amazing reefs. This, uh, this photo here was one of the uh, reefs that Dirk was just talking about. Um, of Lophelia coral, which is one of the, the few corals that off our coast that we know about that actually makes these reefs. You can see there's uh, basket stars and just a tremendous diversity in here. Um, so so it, it really was, uh, I think, a, a special thing for us to be able to find some of these reefs and document them uh, in, in ways that no one had seen before. Um, these are some large uh, Gorgonian corals. You can see uh, uh, a rockfish here hiding in the coral right there. So documenting not just these corals, but these important associations with, uh, with important fish species. This was, this was a critical piece to what we were able to bring back. And, and this was a really kind of spectacular find as well on, on one of the gold corals. We, we noticed these, uh, these little uh, uh, shapes that are, are scientists refer to as mermaids purses. And in fact, what they are is live embryos of a species of shark called a cat shark that's actually using the corals as a place to keep their eggs safe so that up, up there uh, uh, above the, uh, the seafloor, these eggs are, are protected from things like crabs that might be walking around um, and, and using this basically as a nursery place as, or a nest to put their eggs. So uh, it was really uh, amazing and just kind of speaks to how little we still know about this area you know, we documented thousands of, of corals and sponges that, re that resulted in a 39% increase in the known amount of corals and sponges that were in this area in Southern California. Uh, we documented over 30 different managed fish species that were co-occurring with these corals and sponges, including overfished rockfish like cow cod, this big honking rockfish up here you see on the right. Uh, and, and really throughout the study areas, new substrates, new coral gardens, uh, large, slow-growing corals at numerous sites, uh, things that, that people really weren't aware of in, in just a, a short five-day period that really, I think, showed how much was still left to be discovered. If we, could, if we could find that much stuff in just a few days of exploring with this new technology. Um, it really, I think, showed folks how, how much there still may be left that's, not yet, to be dis that's yet to be discovered. And, uh, and afterwards, um, we teamed up and Mare uh, did the analysis to put together this really fantastic uh, report that was, uh, that was done that showed the beautiful imagery as well as the actual data itself. And we submitted these, this report to uh, groups like the Pacific Fishery Management Council. That's the management body in the federal government that decides what areas are open and closed to bottom trawling. And we did a whole uh, slideshow and showed the photos and some of the fishermen themselves that have been bottom trawling and fishing these areas for decades were just, their jaws just dropped. They had no idea what the seafloor looked like and that it was really that diverse. And, and Jeff, wouldn't you say that that's the power of imagery, that we're visual creatures and that 
if we, if we see a spreadsheet or we look at a graph, it doesn't have the same emotional attachment as when you see something exquisitely beautiful with a myriad of different uh, animals and critters hanging out in it. I, I couldn't agree more. I think that, you know, the data shows the scientific underpinnings, but really it's the visuals that, that tell the story. A picture speaks a thousand words uh, and, and seeing these things, I mean, uh, you know, there were questions about, well, do the fish really use these corals? Uh, you know, you can show all the data you want, uh, but when you actually see the photos of the fish right there, I, I think we can connect to that because we are such visual creatures. And, and knowing that, and, and so generating stories like this one in the Union, San Diego Union Tribune about exploring corals in our uh, coral gardens in our own backyard just really, I think, captured the imagination of, of the public and the people that live off the Southern California coast. Um, this all led up to a huge victory uh, in November 19th, 2019. Uh, where the Pacific Fishery Management Council actually approved and voted unanimously to protect this large area of the Southern California Bight, extending from you know, Santa Barbara all the way down to the Mexico border, uh, over 100 miles offshore. The total area is about 16,000 square miles. That so, so Jeff, in, in summary, would you say that the, the, the video and the digital still imagery that you were able to bring to the fishermen and the commissioners who control West Coast fisheries resulted in that huge protection, which will be felt for generations? Dirk, I, I couldn't agree more. I think that the, you know, what we really were able to do because of these images is, is bring things that people hadn't seen before and, and created a, a monumental precautionary uh, victory for, uh, for the Southern California area and, and the entire West Coast, ultimately, that was really driven by the, the, uh, the excitement that these images uh, uh, brought out in people, by the scientific understanding that I think they helped show and uh, and I think it really just uh, it really shows it's a it's a great example of how doing this science in a great partnership, bringing down the best technologies, you know, with some of the smartest uh, engineers that Mario was able to bring in, and and really then bring these back to to fishery managers. This this was uh, I, I think a game changer and really changed and turned the tide in terms of our understanding. Uh, not just of scientists, but of, of the people that are actually making the huge decisions. And we had this, the support of the state of California uh, in, in doing this and, and the leadership. Uh, Governor Gavin Newsom uh, personally got involved and was compelled by the images that he saw and wrote letters uh, in support of this. And, and so I think, you know, this is just a great example of how Mari's work uh, out there exploring these areas can, can really result in tangible, real protections that are going to last for generations. And, and it was kind of legacy work because we grew up watching Jacques Cousteau. And so to, what I always loved being an engineer was the technology of the mini submarines and, and the things they were inventing. Even the scuba tank Jacques and Emile Gagnon invented uh, in, in the mid 40s, I believe. And so to be out with his granddaughter uh, deploying technologies that we built uh, to get you the data that then you could take to the highest level of fishery management and get this incredible result was really, uh, it was very inspiring for us to know that, you know, we're also a nonprofit as you are at Oceana is that by doing the right thing, you can, you can sometimes get the right result. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's really, for me, just personally and professionally, I mean, it, it really is a success story. And I, I think we, we all, you know, people scuba diving and all that have a sense that, you know, there's this uh, just amazing uh, other planet out there that is, is existing, coexisting with us that, that most people have no idea of is out there. And I think it's that appreciation that and that, the, that this really helped uh, inspire in people. And just the story of an expedition, of the, the challenges of getting out there and the, the weather and you know, going out on this boat and trying to figure out how, how you know, to get all these different pieces in place. Uh, that whole story it just captivated people. The, the idea of adventures, that there's still adventures to be had out here. There's still new things to discover and new treasures that, that are out there that we haven't even scratched the surface of yet. That's, that's, I think, what, what, uh, what the, the real value of, of this was. And, and to be able to do that and go out on this 
this, uh, you know, we had a mission. It wasn't just to gather data, it was to get places protected and to actually see that happen and to see it change the hearts and, and minds of, uh, you know, people that otherwise are kind of more all about business, you know, uh, and get them amazed. I mean, it makes you kind of feel like a little kid again. And, and that's what it did for me. And I think that's what it helps awaken in everybody. And we, we hope that our viewers will think about both Oceana and Marine Research and Exploration on Giving Tuesday now. So both organizations are raising funds today and throughout the year to, to explore this ocean wilderness. Again, about three, depending on who you believe, three to 4% has been explored below 100 feet deep. And yet that's where the biodiversity is. That's where the deep sea corals are. That's where the, the, the fish protein is. So this is a critical area we need to understand fully in order to, to steward it wisely um, for future generations.